Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Today's episode is pretty interesting. You're going to want to listen through to the end because we talk about vibration, which is something that can be completely woo woo. I definitely hold uh, our guest on this episode accountable for what can we measure, what can we not measure. But we talk about a whole bunch of different things that can increase your energy in your life, however you decide to measure it. Uh, so we get into some science here, we get into some best practices, and I think you've got a lot to learn from this. So listen through to the end and let me know what you think by leaving a review on iTunes. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that scientists in Denmark recently published some new research that showed that certain bacteria in your gut play a much more decisive role in regulating your weight than we ever understood before. Which means that something as simple as a little poop sample might be able to tell you what nutrition is gonna work best for your body and your gut biome and what's going to change there. And that can be profoundly interesting, especially when you consider the way you eat changes which bacteria in your gut. And so this new research just adds even more evidence to uh, the fact that I'm really excited about Viome. Uh, you've heard the episode with Naveen Jain, who came on and talked about this new way to see what's going on inside your gut, including fungal things that, that aren't accounted for even in this research out of Denmark, uh, as well as viruses and phages and all sorts of stuff. So if, if you're interested in learning more about your gut, which definitely can influence weight loss and what you should be putting in your mouth, uh, you can go to Viome, V-I-O-M-E dot com. You can use the code Bulletproof and they do something nice for you. I think they might give you a, a copy of one of my books or something. Uh, I'm not even sure. But anyway, go to Viome if you're interested in getting a good picture of what's going on in your gut. I'm an advisor to the company and I've been, uh, I've, I've been, I haven't been this excited about a new diagnostic or a new kind of test or just more information about this than I have since the days of Quantified Self. And this new research from Denmark just kind of adds one more data point to that. And before we get into today's show, something amazing is here. And I'm going to see if I can pick it up with one hand. It is the new Bulletproof Coffee Cold Brew Ready to Drink. In fact, I'm holding four of them. If you're watching on YouTube, you can go to bulletproof.com slash YouTube if you want to get a link to the channel that has this show. But I'm holding these things up. These are shelf stable, meaning you can keep them in your purse, in your briefcase, uh, in your workout bag, in your car, wherever, and they will not spoil. They don't have to be refrigerated, but they're good when they're chilled. We've got mocha, we've got original, we've got vanilla, and we've got one with collagen. So if you don't have time to make Bulletproof, you want to replace a snack with something that's going to leave you full for hours and feeling amazing, these taste really good, and they've got only good stuff in them. So that's Bulletproof, uh, Bulletproof Cold Brew ready to drink. You can pick them up on bulletproof.com. We'll ship them to you. I believe there's free shipping right now. Double check on the site for that, depending on where you are in the world. And you'll find that these are amazing cold brew. And they, of course, have the lab-tested beans, brain octane oil, and grass-fed butter. So bulletproof.com for the Bulletproof Cold Brew ready to drink. Today's guest on the show is a former psychotherapist, a university professor, a successful author, and creator of the popular site greensmoothiegirl.com. She's based in Utah, where she's a competitive tennis player, and she just wrote a new book uh, that I enjoyed that's called Vibe, Unlock the Energetic Frequencies of Limitless Health, Love, and Success. And she's on the show today to talk about this notion of vibration, so we can see, all right, how much how much science is here? How much sort of, let's all sing kumbaya is here? Because there is real vibration that happens in our bodies and it's always a challenge to tie uh, the, the scientific vibrations to behavioral vibrations and you know what's, what's an emotion or a sensation and what's not. So Robin Openshaw is here today to share her knowledge and what she learned in her research over the last couple of years writing this book. Robin, welcome to the show. Thanks, it's so nice to be here. It's always, a little bit risky for an author to go out there and write about vibrational frequencies because you'll see people out there you know saying look if you you know where my organic corn pendant your vibrations going to change like it it can get really mushy really quickly what led you uh, from sort of the field of nutrition into this idea of vibration like like what's the definition of vibration the way you're using it in your book you know, years ago, I tripped on this quote by Einstein that said, everything in life is vibration. 
And later, not much later, I ran into a quote by Nikola Tesla, who I'm a bit of a Tesla geek. And Tesla said, and I believe that the world wasn't ready to hear this at the time when Einstein and Tesla were discovering these amazing things. And Tesla said, if you want the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And I put that next to the Einstein quote. And then I started looking at quantum physics and how all of the quantum theory has bled into biology. And there are fields that have completely changed as a result of discovering that, for instance, we are electron exchanging. And right now you have influence over other people. And it's really sobering to think about. And think about how we're actually electron exchanging across the planet. This has been super well documented at this point. And we can go two woos, we can go woo woo, or we can stay just in the one woo and as committed to science as you are, Dave, I'll just stay in the one woo. I mean, we could talk about how, <laughs> you know, this is what my, I, I actually got that quote from Simon and Schuster when they signed on to, to uh, publish my book. They said, now keep it to one woo. Okay. <laughs> so, well, that, uh, that's the risk when you go into quantum physics is that quantum biology is a real field uh, that is studied in universities and most people aren't even aware of it. But what's going on inside our mitochondria, the way they're making energy, they're using quantum effects. And we finally figured that out. We figured out that you know, mitochondria are uh, semiconductive and they do have these fields. But even when you say like we're exchanging electrons with things across the planet, you already tr kind of tricked my thing. And we exchange energy, but are we actually really trading electrons with other beings? How are we doing that? Yeah, that's a lot of what quantum physics actually discovered uh, literally decades ago, is that, and this is why we're so interconnected. It's one of the reasons why we've discovered how interconnected we are, is that things aren't as mechanistic as we thought. I mean, we know we have this, you know, atom, and we have electrons and protons and nucleus, but we don't, we didn't know as recently as 30 years ago, how big that radius is of those electrons. And we didn't understand how we need to discharge dirty energies. I loved your show with uh, Joe Mercola talking about EMF, which is a big research subject and interest of mine. But we are we're exchanging energies in a lot of ways that we didn't understand when we were only looking at Newton's models. So if we go back to, if we take a look at how uh, quantum physics and biology have not yet come into the space of nutrition and wellness. And what my what my book Vibe does is take a look at what we can do that's really practical and takes a look at foods, energies that has nothing to do with calories. Calories is a is a construct that was discovered in 1848. It's pretty much outlived its usefulness in so many ways. And so when when I when I tripped on these two concepts, I wanted to know what the secrets of the universe were. When I when I read if you want the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. I thought, why do I know so little about this? We actually know more about it than, than we think. If you take a look at medicine, for instance, a lot of the diagnostics in medicine are using vibrational frequency. The EEG, the e ECG, you can, we can measure brain waves. These are frequencies. So I'm just putting some roots in the idea that energies or understanding that everything is made up of energies and that Newton's physics weren't wrong, they were just limited, actually has applications in medicine. Your friend, Dr. Oz, I know you were just out there filming with him, has said that energy medicine is the next wave in, in Western medicine. And it's very, very infiltrated there. What I got frustrated with, because I've written all these nutrition books, and I'm always looking for what else don't I know is that somehow we're still living in Newton's physics when it comes to uh, nutrition. There is a vibrational frequency associated with every single food. I'm actually doing some research with a PhD scientist named Beverly Rubick. And I can talk to you if you want about some of the ways that we measure vibrational frequency and what these energies are. And we could talk about some principles of quantum physics that have everything to do with whether we're healthy and whether we're happy that can guide us in what foods that we eat. They'll be a lot more helpful than, than uh, counting calories and worrying about grams of proteins, fats, and carbs, which is um, not necessarily serving Americans very well. But let me, let me tell you really fast about HeartMath Institute. Some, some things that they do that will give you a sense of how real this woo stuff is, 
is that you and I could be sitting in a room, Dave, with our backs to each other. So we're not looking at each other and we are not talking to each other. And you're hooked up to an EEG and I'm hooked up to an ECG. And you are instructed to think loving, kind, grateful thoughts. And that will actually register on my EEG without you saying a word or without us looking at each other. And so this makes intuition and a lot of these energy gifts that we talk about that sound really squishy, like you said, quite quantifiable. There's also some great research by HeartMath where you are asked to sit and think about something that makes you angry and they chart your brain waves and then they have you think about things that you're grateful for and they chart your brain waves. And what's really interesting is that those frequencies as they register on paper look like what they feel like, right? Like which would you rather experience? Would you rather sit in anger or would you rather sit in gratitude and love? Well, I mean, it depends. You know, anger could be a source of energy, right? Yep. Well, and it can fuel you to action. We need it sometimes, right? <laughs> I, I was just saying that to, to, to try and make you mad, but it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> no. So I, I've been an advisor to the Hard Math Institute since 2008. I'm on their advisory board. And uh, I was just at Burning Man, and they had a big installation there where they would get like eight people uh, to sit in chairs. And when they were all in the same state, that gratitude state you're talking about, um, they'd get a really strong feedback tone that would like, you know, make light up an art piece, which was kind of cool. So, so there's there's definitely very provable science that says we can influence other people. And I don't, you know, to the original question, I don't think that we're actually trading electrons with them unless we're touching them or, you know, kissing them or something. Mucous membranes are good for electron exchange because they're, they're wet. Um, but uh, we are definitely exchanging field information with people. And, you know, the, the heart math people talk about this, this torus shaped like donut shaped field around the heart tipped it eight degrees to the left and unquestionably if especially someone who's who's trained uh like uh, a meditator or you know just someone who, who's in touch with that stuff can walk into a room and change the room but likewise someone who has a powerful uh, a powerful field around their heart but one that's chaotic because they're full of old trauma or just they're pissed off they can walk into a room and change the energy in the room for the negative. And, and that's one of the reasons that I, I just fundamentally believe that it's not okay to sit in a boardroom or a you know, PTA meeting or at dinner with your family and act one way and feel another way. Because your internal state is projected and received uh, by other things in the world around you, whether or not you're smiling and saying the right things. People know that you're pissed off. And we know it viscerally and deep down. And, and that is a form of you know, electromagnetic, and that's actually more magnetic uh, vibration. So there's, there's definitely science, uh, like you're talking about in your book, around that, uh, around that very specifically. And uh, talk a little bit more about the, the quantum biology aspect of, of vibration. Like, like how, how would you measure vibration, say, of, of a food? Are you like eating a food and seeing what it does on an EEG or what it does to your heart rate variability? Like, how do you know that a food's vibrating? Because when I eat them, they're usually not, unless it's jello. Yeah. Well, there, you know, there are energy fields in and around us. And like you were referring to, we have an energy field. It goes, it goes further than we thought. But you're talking about this energy field that's about eight, eight feet around us is our electromagnetic field. But there's a guy, he is deceased now, and I'm going to take measuring electromagnetics further than he did. But his name's Bruce Tyno. He's out of University of Washington. And the reason I talk about his research is that he measured a lot of common things and because he measured it in hertz. And so our electrical energy is we are electrical beings. That's why when we go out in the sun, we feel amazing. You know, we need to charge. We need to discharge and ground. Um, and we feel better when we do, especially in this crazy world where we're just surrounded by all these electronics like you, you talked about with Dr. Mercola. But he measured things in electrical energy of hertz. And so we recognize that as a unit of measure. So bear with me. I'm going to share a couple of statistics from Tino's research where he uh, measured in hertz, which we're, we're familiar with if we had some basic high school science classes. 
And before I tell you this, like if it, if, if you're listening to this interview and you remember one thing, maybe a couple of things, this would be one of the ones to remember. This is a principle of quantum physics that's really simple. Anyone can understand. And here it is. So the substance of a higher frequency can cause a substance of a lower frequency to increase. And this is really powerful if we think about the fact that you with your show and you've had something like 40 something million downloads, you're impacting people's energies one direction or the other, whether you're helping them into higher vibrations or lower, you're absolutely impacting their energies, whether it's electron exchange or if it's other forms of changing people's frequencies. You know, if you take that principle of quantum physics, I'm going to say it again, a substance of a higher frequency can cause a substance of a lower frequency to increase. And then let's take a look at... But it, some, isn't that opposite also true? You take yes, hot water and put it with cold water. Well, they the cold water gets warmer, the hot water gets colder. So it, it's sort of like moving to the average, right? Yes. And so okay. the, the opposite, the corollary is absolutely true too, is a substance of a lower frequency can cause a substance of a higher frequency to decrease. And this is, you know, I'm going to talk about food for, for a minute, but just so we don't so we don't fail to bring this up. You mentioned how people have incongruent energies and what's coming out of their mouth is different than how they actually feel and think. And we know it. We know it. We, especially if you, we have a quiz to tell you if you're an intuitive, an empath, a highly sensitive person, an energy healer. And, and, you know, we know it, we sense it. Our intuition tells us this person is not is not connecting with us. You, you've probably walked into a room before. You, you, I know you to be an empath. I, I have seen you sense energies before. We've all been, um, if we have developed our, our energy sensations, we've walked into a room and there's two people in the room and they're not looking at each other or talking to each other, but we know that something really intense just happened between them, right? You can feel it. You can sense it. It's almost like there's a charge there and they might have just had a big fight. They might have just had sex. Those are two of the highest energy exchange forms that we have. But is, you may is that have also... Why, is that why makeup sex is so good? Yes, it's part of it. You're resolving energies, right? <laughs> like you're joking, but I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, it's shifting energies the other direction. And so we probably also like been at a conference or some networking or work event where we, we meet someone and we can't get away from them fast enough. You know, we almost like rock back on our heels when we meet them. And it's not that they're bad people, it's that there's a dissonant frequency there. You know, like notes on the piano are sound frequencies. And if you play the black and white note that are right next to each other, we don't like that, right? Like no composer ends a piece on dissonant frequencies. And so you've had the opposite experience too, where you meet someone at an event of some kind and maybe you've only interacted with them for 30 seconds or maybe you haven't even interacted with them and it's almost like they're pulling you across the room. You are seeking them out. You spend a minute with them and you're figuring out when you can spend time with them again. Those are resonant frequencies. Those are just simpatico frequencies. So let's talk about food with regard to that very specific principle, which is a substance of a higher frequency can cause a substance of a lower right. frequency to I, increase. I totally get that point. But how do you measure frequency of a food? <laughs> yeah. Like so there's, there's, we, before I tell you a few measurements in Hertz, including what healthy people are, I want you to know that I have just commissioned a study with Dr. Beverly Rubick, and we're going to be measuring people before and after they eat specific foods. Maybe we should get some bulletproof coffee for that. And also the foods themselves with two different ways. One is with uh, biophotonic emissions. And so you're actually measuring the weak light that emanates from living things, well, actually dead things too. I mean, if you take a tiny piece of, you know, chicken breast and put it under a high powered microscope, you don't, you don't see nothing. You don't see no movement. They, it is in, in motion or otherwise it wouldn't decompose and become, become something else. But we're going to measure with biophotonic emissions. And the reason I want to do that rather than just measure everything in Hertz, which there's actually data already out there about that, but, but Hertz, is that it makes pretty pictures. So Hertz is, is basically number of times per second something happens, right? So you can you know, jump up and down three times a second. That's three Hertz, which is different than, you know, three Hertz sound wave, right? Right. Like, like, so they're, they're different things. It's just number of times per second. But what is it that's happening at X number of Hertz times per second? Like, do we... 
Well, this is just this is just one way to look at some of our energies because we have electrical energies, we have magnetic energies, we have electromagnetic energies. We have energies that nobody has actually quantified yet, but we can we can measure the effects of those energies, but there's no names for it. There's it's an energetic world and there's so much we don't know. But Beverly Rubick also has this really expensive Russian technology that uses gas chromatography. And I want I want to do some research with that because, again, it becomes really visual. And so those are some of the ways that you can measure energies. But so these I are, want to go back to Hertz. Okay. Um, so the, just let's touch briefly on the biophotonic stuff because I think a lot of people listening uh, probably don't know what a biophoton is. And it's ridiculously cool that if you go back like 25, 30 years ago, there's something called curly in photography, which people said, oh, that's a bunch of BS. You, know, you have someone put their hand or a leaf on film for a long period of time and then you see like a ghost image and they kind of said oh that's all bs now though with new ccd cameras the kind of cameras that we're actually using to record this for instance we actually have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt published in biomedical journals of substantial repute that your body and leaves and and all sorts of things actually do put out photons we know even this was a big shock we know your DNA actually makes photons. Photons are individual particles of light. We know that your mitochondria make a lot more of this, and the bacteria in your gut make about 5,000 times more of this, what's essentially bioluminescence, these little glowing things. But it happens so infrequently and at such small doses that you don't see it unless you have very advanced technology for it. So there's, there's good science that says, all right, you can measure that. In fact, you can even predict things like cancer by looking at biophoton emissions. And like, who would have ever thought that? And if that sounds like... Like that's you know three levels of woo. Actually, no, that's established medical science. It's just stuff you haven't heard of. You don't believe me? Go to PubMed. <laughs> like that stuff is legit. Um, but yeah, let's get back to Hertz because I still want to know what are we measuring with Hertz? Yeah, so Tino took a lot of different healthy people who didn't have any known disease states, and he measured them all between 62 to 68 hertz of energy. And so if you write another thing down or remember another thing that I tell you, remember that is that a healthy human being ranged between 62 and 68 hertz of energy. Was that like brain waves or was that like a magnetic pulsation? Was that like the sound of their voice? Like I, I'm still stuck on what is a hertz? Well, you could actually measure specific organs as well. And so he measured genius human brains in the, the mid 80 hertz. Okay. So I'm sure that you would have brain, brain energy of 85 so, hertz. Well, that would be like a, a high gamma state, like gamma is usually around 60. Um, but I'm, I, I'm still, I guess I'm kind of wondering, like, is that the same hertz that we use with lettuce? Well, you know, <laughs> he... Tino's dead now, and so if he if he were alive, I would have lots of questions for him about his research. But okay. and 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 there's there's so little, there's really so little done. But it's it's really well documented that you can measure energies. I wish we had I mean, a Fitbit. Yeah, there's. I want, I want to eventually have a Fitbit so that we can all know what happens to our energies when we eat this, when we think this, when we don't metabolize a negative emotion like fear or or anger. So. And, and that, that I would agree. There, there's many different ways to measure energy. And the people who do this best originally were uh, out of Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine and Chinese medicine, um, or even some of the shamanic practices. You know, they, they put their fingers on your pulse and, and some of the Qigong practices. These are people who use their body and their developed nervous system to feel what's going on with someone else. And now we can measure those fields at a uh, with, with a variety of, of equipment. There's, you can do magnetic, you can do electrical. And one of the things that, that stands out in my memory, almost 20 years ago, I went to this coffee shop in Mountain View, California called Red Rock Coffee uh, that I used to frequent when I lived down there. And I met with the guy who holds the first patent on 802.11b, which is basically the first Wi-Fi on the planet. And this guy already back then was kind of the, the grizzled engineer sort of look. And he said, Dave, and this was maybe, I don't know, five, 10 years after the stuff was released, so he had become wealthy. And he said, Dave, I've been using the million dollar test equipment we use to, to monitor Wi-Fi networks, and I turned it around on my body. And he turns his laptop around, he goes, look at all this data that's coming off my body. I think we can use this to diagnose disease. Like, look at these, these and it was actually like a map of the chakras, like he had mapped using gear for Wi-Fi, right? And, and so this, this stuff is real, and there's, 
there's a uh, an $800 book from the former president of the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, which is one of the top 10 medical schools out there, uh, was published in 1983 that basically said everything in the body is electrical, which means therefore you can measure the frequency of electricity uh, in a variety of ways. And and basically after he published this book with extreme details, it was a full on medical textbook at our time with parts of it because it just went so far into cellular biology where it, especially when I read this a few years ago, I was like, wow. and um, he actually lost his position at the Karolinska Institute for saying this, and he wrote the book at the end of his career because he knew it would happen. He goes, hey, I've been doing this for a long time. Here's what's going on. And uh, when he lost his position, he was like, I was going to retire anyway. Here you go. Now it's out there. So, so like, like, I just want people listening to understand there's a lot going on that we've known in small pockets for thousands of years or for you know decades or especially in the last 10 years. And I think you've pulled a lot of it together in uh, in your book, uh, which is kind of cool, but also just making it actionable because knowing this is happening versus knowing what to do with it. And everyone listening knows like today, I have a lot more energy than I had before. And how you measure that energy, like there's dozens of ways, but the Russians and the former East Germans and now just Germany in general have been the leaders in a lot of these weird things where you bring it to us like, what? You got me hold copper coils, but they're getting a signal, and and there is a signal there. And the question is, what do we do with it? Uh, so I, I want to know in uh, in your work about looking at all these these different frequencies and just ways to to measure and improve energy in the body. Like, like okay, I want more energy. Like, what do I do? Yeah, and there are so many things. And as a former therapist, you know, I feel like just like nutrition is missing studies of, you know, quantum theory, so has therapy, so has psychotherapy, so has psychology and psychiatry. And how we are dealing with our negative emotions is part of it. We could talk about that. We could talk about foods. Let me, let me tell you. So 62 to 68 Hertz was a healthy human being. Tino measured people with a massive candida overgrowth where there's just a ton of yeast in the body that is getting all the attention of a lot of the energy systems, uh, would be in the low fifties. That's how much lower a human so, being can go. He, so he, uh, sorry to interrupt there, Robin. I'm guessing that what he was doing there is he was looking at the micro current across the skin. This is probably a galvanic skin response, like copper coils sorts of things, because that that would make sense then. Yeah, he called it the BT3 scanning system, and it was definitely looking at the whole okay. organism's energies. And so that's probably some kind of aggregate of our of all of our energies, because you know he could tell you he could also ascertain you know the level of energy of your liver. And you can imagine how if you build your liver out of higher vibration materials, since the liver serves you in over 500 different ways, like what would that do for how you look and for how you feel? He measured he measured people with Epstein-Barr in the 50s, 50s hertz. Remember a healthy human 62 to 68? He measured uh, end stage, very near death cancer patients at 25 hertz. So clearly there's some kind of correlation there between, you know, specific high frequency states and health. And the opposite of that is the sicker we get, the lower we get. And he discovered that plant foods, and I'm not here to, you know, you know, I don't really like to talk about vegetarian, vegan, or any of the isms or diets, but he discovered that plants raise our vibration because they are of higher vibrational frequencies, many of them, uh, than, than a human being is. And processed foods, this won't surprise you, are extremely low frequency foods. So yeah. then there's then there's the fact that we can measure what happens to a person when, like I said, they are in the high vibration emotions. And that sounds like what all the woo-woo people talk about. It sounds like people talk about high vibes and, and we roll our eyes and we think that they're just channeling the Beach Boys or they or they don't know what they're talking about. It's just like this kind of cool new agey talk, but it's actually real. Mm-hmm. And we can't measure a thought and we can't measure a feeling because it only exists if we're feeling it. But when gratitude is the highest measured frequency in terms of what happens to you when you are sitting in gratitude, thinking about your kids, thinking about your partner, thinking about people you love, thinking about the things in your life you're, you're grateful for, nothing touches it. And I think that's really exciting because we can choose that. 
We can choose to spend 10 seconds in gratitude. That's an actionable. That's, um, that's something that we take people through in the book. There's a quiz to identify all the high vibration states. How much are you, are you actually experiencing those in your daily life? And here are the low vibration states. Okay. Feeling frustrated and stuck, uh, angry, uh, anxiety, rage, you know, anger, rage, um, these are, we know this innately. We know these are low vibration emotions. And then I take people through a 90 second process where instead of getting stuck in anger, frustration, uh, resentments, lack of forgiveness, you at 40 years of Zen, I'm going to be there at 40 years of Zen in December. Super excited about yeah. that. The lack of forgiveness is about as low vibration as you can get. And that's an energy that people tend to get stuck. So you know, it's really exciting to think that we can alter our energies. And, and those are some of the things that we work on is those emotional energies and staying in the higher ones more often. We should be outside in contact with earth every day. We're literally dropping, you know, millions of electrons onto the earth and picking up antioxidants. Um, the earth itself has been measured at 528 Hertz, the core of the earth. Um, there are people like there. These are these are pretty woo, pretty, pretty triple woo here. But Leonard Horowitz measures, um, you know, vibrations of a lot of different things to help us achieve them. And what? so that's the point. So we achieve more of them. Got it. And I I just looked at the BT three patent, and huh? and because maybe I'm stuck on this because I'm a computer science engineering guy. But what we're talking about is measuring the phase and oscillation of the electromagnetic frequency from uh, the body or from a biological material. And so if, if people are saying, well, there's no science, whatever, it's woo. No, there's a patent. It's an old one. Uh, but you can, you can look it up on Google Patent Search, which I just did. I uh, love that you looked that up. <laughs> well, hey, I, I am nothing if not a geek. Uh, so it's called, the, it's called the BT3 monitoring system. Yep, and it, it's actually patented. And, and what they were looking to do is what a lot of the tech out of Germany and Russia does, which is, okay, what's the what's what electromagnetics are coming off the body, and uh, when we look at electromagnetic frequencies that come off the very subtle ones, but ones that are real that come off of foods, especially living foods or fresh foods, they can be cooked and still have an electromagnetic frequency, mm -hmm. uh, and then look at what the interaction interplay between those is and. And that's pretty cool. And, and undoubtedly, and, and I know this because we see it on EEG signals all the time at 40 years of Zen, the food you put in your body, the supplements you put in your body can change your brain states. They can change the electromagnetic frequencies. And we use pulsed electromagnetic frequencies to change the brain. And certainly the brain can make its own pulse, actually more the heart than the brain, but they can both make uh, PEMF that changes your biology as well as that of things around you. So, so there's there's definitely legitimacy to this kind of stuff. Um, and when someone goes through and changes uh, and, and forgives something or changes the way their body unconsciously resonates in response to an environmental stimuli, well, if you believe what's in your book and you believe what, what we're talking about right now, which is that, okay, it's plausible that the stuff going on below your consciousness in your body can have an impact on the world around you. And if you don't believe that, we can show you with an electromagnetic meter. Like, like so if you don't believe that, it's because you're a skeptic and you'd like to do some forgiveness or something. Someone tried to trick you in third grade and you're still stuck on that. So like deal with it, don't be a science troll. And then after that, okay, is it conceivable that when you change the way your visceral tissues respond to an environmental stimulus that it would change the signal that comes off your body. And what you've written in your book is that, well, that's actually what happens. And I, I think it's fair to say that we don't necessarily know the mechanisms between uh, you know, forgiveness, uh, between forgiveness or letting go of an old trauma or healing something. Like every step between that and things changing, I don't think we know all that. But we can say your heart rate variability will change and we can measure that on the skin or away from the body. Right, and we can also show your brain waves change. So then, an inner thought pattern changes a vibrational pattern. The vibrational pattern changes the way you interact with the world around you. But the flip side of that, which is where we're going, is okay. If you believe that there's a, a, a frequency in food, and if you don't believe that, well, look at the patent for the BT3, and there's a whole bunch of other work around that sort of stuff. And yeah, some of it is in the woo spectrum. All new inventions are always woo until they become self-evident to everyone. And then, oh look, no, I invented that. You're like, 
I thought last month you didn't like that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, what happens there is, is there's some interaction going on and your book is one of the, the early books looking, all right, what do, we, what do we do about that? So now you talk about these, these foods that are higher vibration foods. Um, certainly if you ask someone from any of the systems of acupuncture or Ayurveda or Chinese medicine, they would already tell you. Uh, yeah, some foods are have different vibrations. And heck, I've had a doctor in LA tell me, Dave, you need to eat chicken, but it can only be black chicken. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, there's black skin chickens. You need to eat a male black skin chicken. It has a different vibration. <laughs> I actually never found a male black skin chicken. But hey, <laughs> like maybe he was just completely full of crap, but you know, he was going on, you know, thousands of years of what they've noticed. So like, I'm not going to say we know everything. I doubt you or I collectively, if we, if we stuck our brains together, know everything. But we do know enough to say there's steps you can take now uh, that can increase your vibration. So, all right, I'm sure by now people are going, um, maybe this is BS, maybe not. I'll tell you, I don't think it is. But what are the foods uh, or other things, uh, forgiveness you mentioned, we both agree on that, but especially foods that could increase the body's vibration? Do you want to know what the class of foods is that has the highest vibration? We all know it's bacon. Come on. You'll be surprised. <laughs> it, yeah, we, we want it to be butter and bacon, right? Is um, fruit. Fruit actually is the highest vibration. That was a surprise to me. I thought it'd be greens, but greens are the second highest. It, it makes sense because if you are going to have babies, you look at in humans, what humans have the highest vibration is babies. And it's because fruit is plant babies. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't have other things like tons of sugar and other things in them that are interesting. So um, I'm, uh, I'm definitely interested in, uh, in where you're going with that. So any kind of fruit more impactful than others? I actually am going to take this into my research with Dr. Rubik because I don't have enough data on enough foods. Uh, but there's definitely some inferences you can make about classes of foods. But, you know, even if we did stay back in the old calorie uh, way of looking at things and counting grams of macronutrients, there's a lot of alignment there. Like we know we feel good when we eat more whole foods. I think we can all agree on that. No. And the whole... The <laughs> Seriously, are you processed food? Are you stuck on the whole grain thing? But if you no. eat a whole food, I'm counting you to eat the shell of the walnut, the shell of the egg. I mean, what the hell is a whole food anyway, Robin? I mean, let's well, I, I gotta okay, ask you. So let's, let's <laughs> say less less is added to it, less is done to it, less is stripped out of it, and that, that makes it more whole. I mean, you're exactly right. Like it's not like we get almonds out of the tree and eat them with those hard shells <laughs> on the outside. Yeah, and like cashews, like the outside of a cashew is caustic to your skin. You have to right. boil it before you can get to the middle to eat it. All right. So like when someone says whole foods, I'm like, right, that's just like a calorie. It's a meaningless term. Um, and, and so I, 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 I didn't actually hold John Mackey to that standard. Well, because he's a friend and also he just wrote a whole book about it um, when I interviewed him. Um, but you know, great respect for the idea that, that you know, nutrients matter uh, and they do. I'm just I'm a little skeptical when someone says whole foods have more vibration. Yeah, they, you know doesn't mean that you want to eat the whole food. You don't eat the tree either. You, know, you don't eat the stock behind everything. So what's going on is we're selectively choosing the parts of foods that we want to eat, and we always have. And, and I think that there's room for, for maximizing what we get out of foods. But that doesn't mean that you want to take it, boil it down into you know, one component in the food, uh, and then mix it with MSG and margarine, and then call it a meal, because we all clearly know that there's nothing left in there that we want to eat. Right. Right. Okay. Micronutrients are gone. Fiber is gone. But for some reason, when a plant food, whether it's an almond or a piece of kale or whatever it is, is not too disturbed, and it came recently from the ground where it's drawing up all this nutrition, it has high vibrational energy as well as more fiber and you know, and it hasn't oh, yeah. been sitting in this, the supply chain. I mean, the, a lot, part of the problem with processed foods is, you know, because we, we make, we make, um, you know, consumable products as does Bulletproof. And it's been really interesting to learn that if you get, if you get a raw material right before its expiration date, as long as you get it in your finished product, it sort of starts over. And so like we could put like dried carrot powder into a product that now has a two year shelf life. Um, but that carrot powder has been in the supply chain for two years. By the time somebody eats it, it might literally have been sitting there for four years. This this has got to have an effect on energies. And so to me, it's not, I don't think we have the data right now to nail down every single food. And I want to be part of bringing more research to it. 
But what's interesting is what we already know is good for us is also good for our electromagnetic frequencies. And yeah. you know that, you remember that movie like 10 years ago, I was a big eye roller. You know how you were talking about it a minute ago that, that, um, you know, we're skeptics all the way until we aren't. And then sometimes, you know, especially at your age and mine, things we were skeptical of 10 years ago, maybe now with more data, more knowledge, more experience, uh, we we come around well, on. Well, I, I saw that that movie. Uh, did you see the movie The Secret and sort of roll your eyes at it? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, it was kind of like I didn't I didn't love how little evidence there was, and it would just talk about how you drive into the Walmart parking lot and think good intentions, and the front row parking spot would come available because I was like, well, what about all the other people who drove into the parking lot and they had the intention that they wanted a front row spot. So I, I got all mixed up about it in my head. But the part that's interesting about it is there's all this talk for the last 10 years about law of attraction and it kind of was too many woos for me. Um, but here's the thing. What, what we're finding is that when you are a higher vibration person, when you are oscillating at higher frequencies, you're actually attracting more flow. You're you're capable of more creativity, you're capable of more focus. You are attracting higher levels of opportunity and you find yourself when you're living in high vibrations that things are just easier and you're choosing between two good things instead of being like homeless under a bridge, super low vibration, eating nothing but crap, uh, can't, can't scrape together two, two nickels. And so that's where, to me, my work has been trying to understand what does how does the law of law of attraction come together with all these energies that we're we're in a quantum phase of discovery in the world like you said i mean russia and europe they're way ahead of us in understanding energies and you know over 8000 studies now on the the negative effects on the human organism and other li living organisms of chaotic frequencies or electromagnetic frequencies, whereas the United States is just pretending it's not even a problem. Like our government isn't protecting us from it. The 5G network is coming out and there's a lot of scary intel about that. And and so the point is we can control our energies far more than we and we can be attracting individuals. We're always attracting and repelling something. And it might seem disturbing. Well, I don't want to be at repelling people and things. Yeah, you do. You do. You want to be repelling. Um, but like like we were talking about the resonant frequencies, you know, Tesla, Tesla came to the to the Americas. You know, he's 20 years old and he had literally been having dreams at night about Niagara Falls. And he wanted to come to America and channel the energies of Niagara Falls because the entire sonic spectrum is said to reside in that in that, you know, natural wonder. And he came here and he actually did that. As part of his many accomplishments, he he accumulated like 300 worldwide patents um, before he died. But th the the point is, when it comes to us individually, is that we can channel a lot more positive frequencies. And it really comes down to some really simple, small, actionable things that we do every day. And what I would like is for people to just be more aware that they are electrical beings, that they are electromagnetic. And of course, if we're magnetic beings, we're attracting and repelling. So at, at that point, if you've had a chance to read Headstrong, I'm more talking to listeners, I think you've read it, Robin. Uh, I, there's just abundant evidence that your cells run on semiconductors called mitochondria, and that you do not have a thought, you do not feel an emotion, and you do not make a move, take a breath, have a heartbeat without electrons, the same kind of electrons that power your iPhone. They're literally made from food and air and sunlight and water. And that's just how it works. And sunlight and water are lesser issues there. You get not that much. You can't live on sunlight alone. At least all the people who say they do usually get caught at 7-Eleven eating hot dogs. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I'm a little skeptical of the breatharian sun eaters. Uh, but uh, the, there, there might have been a couple of people who hit that in you know, remote parts of India that are relatively well documented, but uh, not, not in the modern world anyway. So... Um, we, it, if you just accept that, all right, we're electrical, and so that system ought to be able to be higher level energy or low, lower level energy. Um, it's been my experience, especially doing like deep work with neurofeedback, when you can turn up the amount of energy in the cells, like people are able to do more. And gee, doesn't that just make sense? If your car has more horsepower, it can do more. And if your body does, it can. And we were talking about food there, and, and you mentioned the value of fresh food for energy. Most people, 
uh, unless you're fortunate to live you know, near a farmer's market or uh, have your own garden, you don't know what it feels like to eat a meal out of fresh food or to eat a meal out of fresh food for a week in a row. One of the reasons I live where I live is I live on an organic farm. And when I'm home, we eat almost all food that came from our own family and came from our own, you know, our own environment. The, the Tibetans, when you look at the uh, Tibetan medical traditions, they actually tell you minimize the number of people who touch your food before you eat it because it affects the food's energy. And, you know, some of the stuff you're like, well, why? What's the evidence? What's the mechanism? And the answer there is, well, we kind of know that it works, which is a great part of science. It's called observation. And then we can form a hypothesis. And one hypothesis is that it's because there's invisible unicorns that make it happen. Okay, that's <laughs> probably hard to prove, but it's a, a hypothesis until it's disproven as hypothesis. But then we can have other ones that say, well, it has to do with you know mitochondrial things. It has to do with uh, energy exchange and, and resonant frequencies and the entire spectrum in between. But what I think is, is getting to be very well understood is that it matters and it behooves us as scientists and as humans to understand why, because if we understand the mechanisms of it, it's entirely possible that you know the 7G network we deploy will completely upgrade the energy in your body instead of disrupting it. But if we deny that there's an effect, which is an anti-science thing to do, oh, there's an effect, but I didn't like it, therefore the effect didn't happen, which is what a skeptic will do. Uh, and then there's the woo-woo person who says, oh, there's an effect, it's totally the unicorns. Like either one of those, you're on the wrong side of the spectrum. You need to be non-reactive to a new idea. Go, oh, is it plausible? Mm, I, I don't see how that could work. Is there enough evidence that it works versus becoming openly hostile to evidence that doesn't meet the hypothesis that you've religiously attached yourself to? And so as I've aged and as I've become you know, able to take this level of control of my own biology, I was an extreme skeptic, very much a reductionist when I was really, really sick. And in order to get well and to lose 100 pounds and then to go way beyond that, I just realized, look, I'm going to go with what works. And if I don't know why it works, I'm okay with that. I'm just going to measure that it worked. And it's possible I'm, if I'm doing three things at once, only one or two of them worked. And the other one might have been a waste of time, but I'm okay with that. Like, did I get what I wanted? And, and that perspective, I think, is missing from a lot of science here, where it's like, it has to be one thing. It's like, I hate to tell you this. Every science experiment, including the double-blind studies like that, they don't control for almost every variable that matters. Like, show me a, a normal medical, a normal study done on mice or on humans that control for atmospheric pressure. They don't even report on that. Yet, it's a known variable that changes your biology. Do they report on, now I'll get crazy, do they report on space weather? Well, no. I've got gear right over there that uses subtle pulsed electromagnetic frequencies to change your brain states, and they warn you in the instruction manual, you need to go to the NASA website, not you know woowoowoo.com, but the NASA website and look at the space weather because we have found that this kind of, of frequencies, they don't work well if there's a big storm in space or if it's too calm. Like if you wanna get the results, this is an important variable. How many mouse studies looking at you know, what corn nuts do to mice controlled for the type of lighting and the electromagnetic environment? They don't do it, yet they publish these things and we know what's going on. So I have a high degree of questioning when I look at these things because like, I controlled for all the variables. No, you controlled for about 0.1% of the variables or maybe even 0.001%. And it's those other variables that you and I are talking about and what you talk about in your book and they matter. That's why I have fresh food for my garden because it feels better. Why? Someone show me, then I can, you know, I can put it in a bottle. <laughs> like, that sounds great. Uh, but until we recognize it and measure it, I think we have problems here. So, so you, you do, though. You do recommend some foods uh, in, uh, in like, the stuff that comes with your book and, and with, your, with your, I think, in the book itself. So, like, give me, like, some foods that are higher vibration the way you're measuring vibration. Well, it's going to sound self-serving if I say that you can put a lot of them in a green smoothie, but you know, the, the superfoods and it, they tend to line up. This is purely observational. I don't have this research, but they tend to line up with the high micronutrient foods. The foods that are high in vibrational energy are also the ones that are high in micronutrients. Are, are you so, saying eat more veggies? You know, I know it's so boring. It's oh, so boring. Geez. It's like, did we, did we just listen to an hour interview for her to say, eat more vegetables? <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out it's more than that because uh, and this is something that that is really important. All vegetables are not created equal. Right? You can get an organic vegetable that was grown 
in depleted soil uh, that was that sat for a month before you got it that was picked when it was unripe and it's fresh. It might even have a nice sticker that says ripe right on there to tell you it's ripe. Well, that's different than if you pick it and eat it. And right. there's just a fundamental difference there. So this is not just about eating more vegetables. It's about eating higher quality vegetables. And I would say even higher quality meat. The difference in frequency or nutrient availability or how you feel when you're done between an animal that was raised properly on its natural food, ethically raised, ethically slaughtered, and carefully butchered by an artisan and then uh, delivered to you is fundamentally different than an animal that died, that lived in pain, uh, died horribly while watching its other animals die, and then packaged by you know a robot or child prison labor in another country. Um, you feel different when you eat those things. And you might say, Dave, that's BS. There's no reason you feel different. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Pick a reason. Well, it's, it goes back to unicorns. You feel different. Try it. <laughs> exactly. And if you think about the fact that the the state of fear, uh, fear and anger is such low vibration, when you think about an animal raised in those conditions, and Tino, Tino did some research on this, that when you have caged chicken that are mistreated their entire lives, they're low frequency to the point of like two hertz, okay? Two hertz when when we have these animals raised in very, very poor conditions. And we are eating those energies, right? I'm and not. <laughs> you're not, you're not. But, it's unethical but, and bad for you to eat that kind of stuff. It's not food. So okay. I wouldn't want to do that to the animal and I wouldn't want to do it to my own meat. So like, I'm happy to be a vegetarian at a restaurant that doesn't have grass-fed meat um, or wild-caught meat. Otherwise, it's, it's just not worth it. Uh, it you, you don't have to have meat at every meal in order to, uh, to thrive and feel good. Uh, so that's something I would, I would encourage people listening to. Just like, look, eat the good stuff, don't eat the bad stuff. And avoiding the bad stuff, what you would term low-vibration foods, it's actually more important uh, than eating food. It's better to fast than it is to eat crap. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And you can, you are getting, you are getting some really good, those, uh, those eat the sun. You don't need any food if you're out in the sun and you're picking up all the, you know, all the, the good energy exchange from the sun. I don't really understand that whole thing. And I'm not, I'm, I'll be hungry after two meals and I'll just get throwing the towel, I'm sure. But we are getting charge from the sun and there is something to that. Doesn't well, mean that it r rules out that we need food, but yeah. Yeah. There's two things that happen from the sun, the red light from the sun adds electrons to electron chain transport the same way that food does. And the infrared light from the sun changes water in your cells the same way that your mitochondria do. So if the first step of making energy is your mitochondria take food and they use it to make 1200 uh, nanometer light, which is infrared, and they use that to change the structure of water. Well, if you have sunlight with infrared hitting your skin, the water has changed already. So the energy that would have gone into changing water can go into folding proteins or cleaning up the body or into your willpower, into your brain. Those are like the two main sunlight mechanisms and there's some other ultraviolet things happening. But that's another frequency, right? But we're talking about frequencies. You, know, you can measure almost anything in frequencies. You know, what's your frequency of eating? You know, two times a day, three times a day. Uh, and uh, you could even measure that in hertz. You know, how many times they do it? It's, you know, 0.3 hertz or something. Uh, if you average the meals per over some time, period of time. But we do know light frequencies matter. And what's really confusing is that if you take that sunlight or say a healing laser, okay, you can measure the frequency of the light, but then you turn the light on and off at another frequency, which is another hertz. So light that blinks 40 times a second, for instance, reverses Alzheimer's disease in studies. There's a new startup based on that. I, I spent an hour with uh, Harvard-trained uh, neuroscientist uh, who discovered this. Like, why would it matter if the lights flash a certain amount of times? God knows, but there's something going on. Our bodies are listening to light. And that's another one of these vibrational things where, wait, food gives off light. Gut bacteria give off light. Mitochondria are sensitive to light. That's a part of the, the frequency thing. Um, but it's uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, the Yeah, that kind of reminds me of EMDR in in uh, psychotherapy, you know, there's now just hundreds of published studies on how powerful it is. And it's using, it's using frequencies. And that's all really, I mean, and, uh, you know, my colleagues, I'm not, I'm not a practicing therapist anymore, but my colleagues are in love with it. They're all getting trained in it. And it's because it's the most, you know, research based 
um, efficacious treatment right right now out there. I mean, my old models when I was in grad school studying Freudian and behaviorism, behaviorism and gestalt and all these different modalities, you know, all of them, when you put them to the test, a third of people in therapy get better, a third of people in therapy get worse, and a third of people in therapy stay the same. And guess what the statistics are for people in traditional therapy or who aren't in any therapy? They're exactly the same. <laughs> but, but they're wealthier. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, EMDR is profoundly effective, and it involves m moving your eyes back and forth at a certain frequency, right? So what, what I believe is going on here, Robin, is that our brains understand things that happen over a series of time. They don't understand anything that happens over a, a static period, because anything that, that's more than a microsecond. So, and this is born by research on how the prefrontal cortex works. So we have to have time as part of what we do to experience the world. And if you have time, you have frequency by definition. And, and that's just a fundamental part of how our consciousness works, which is kind of cool. Now, we're coming up on the end of the show. We haven't talked a lot about dirty electricity. And this is something that I know that you're spending a lot of your energy on right now. And it's something that I'm, I'm keenly aware of and something that I, I control for something I've talked about for years. Uh, how much of that are you are you talking about in the book? You know, like we mentioned earlier, five G and Wi Fi and things like that. So, so this definitely has an energetic impact on us if you accept the fact that we're electromagnetic beings. Like, kind of, what's your take on that? We do talk about it in the book. We recommend people do a, a detox, and and by detox I mean like an EMF detox. Here in the United States, we refer to it as if we refer to it at all, if we even acknowledge that it exists electromagnetic frequencies. These are these chaotic radiations or radiation or broken frequencies. Um, they're competing with our own flow, our own ability to focus, our own energies that this was never a problem until recently. In Europe, I take, I take some of my followers to a clinic of biological medicine in Switzerland every year, and it's an EMF-free zone. You can't bring your cell phone, your, any device in the treatment rooms in the in the lunch area and there are actual emf refugees there in europe there are emf refugees in europe they mostly call it electro smog which is which is an interesting term but we do talk about that in the book we we cover everything that i know of that's quantifiable they'll actually help you stay in the high smooth frequencies and the grounded frequencies and that's one of them is that we really can't ignore the negative frequencies that we're allowing into our space. And, you know, I mean, one subject is all the electronics. Uh, there's actually energies bleeding from your uh, electrical outlets. When I did a detox here in my office that you're seeing here in the background, if you're watching, it was uh, over 400, whereas below 50, whatever the unit of measure is, is, is safe. We had to address that. Probably one of the worst uh, offenders was my son's uh, Xbox. And I didn't realize he actually had two. I don't know if he hmm. got one from a friend or what, but somehow he bought himself a second one. And it literally fritzed out the meter when it wasn't on just by being plugged in. That was, that was one of the things that we found to be a significant issue. The smart, we don't have a smart meter on our house, um, luckily. And you can tag your smart meter, say, do not install smart meter. And they might do it anyway, but these are just some examples. Uh, we tested my Tesla versus um, one of my employees, Hyundai's and my Tesla was not terrible. <coughs> really, you, you would think since it's a computer, a computer driven car or run car that would have been terrible, but actually it wasn't terrible, but that's because I don't use the Wi-Fi in my Tesla. So if you're driving a battery powered car, consider keeping the Wi-Fi off. Don't, don't sit in your parked car and, and text. Okay. You're just a sitting antenna and don't wear metal while texting in your parked car. <laughs> Lots of things like that, but th there's there's some things that we cover uh, in the book. And you know what else is try not to be around people who suck your energy, talking about negative things all the time. I'm not a Pollyanna. I don't talk about all happy all the time. But if I'm going to talk about the negatives in my life, I'm generally going to do it with a purpose. There's a purpose there to extract meaning from it. I think we can absolutely talk about the negatives in our lives and the hard things that we've been through. And you do this too. You do it too. You and I have in common that we used to be obese. 
And I talk about it often and it's kind of humiliating to talk about being 206 pounds and having 21 diseases, but I love talking about it because then I can talk about the journey and that's where I think we have an impact. And this is where you and I have a clear goal and I want us to all have the languaging of it. I want, I want people to start talking about vibration. I want them to know what it is. I want them to start noticing the impact. But when I'm around you, Dave, you inspire me and you make me, make me think in higher frequency thoughts. You are totally relentless in helping me clear negative vibrations. I'm super excited about doing 40 years of Zen with you. But you know what? We have so much impact on our own energies. And then it gets really exciting when we start to think about our influence, which is massive. Even if people aren't an influencer and have 40 something million downloads of your show, you are energy exchanging when you're on the phone, on the internet. Average person these days has so much ability to impact the vibrations of the whole community and even planet. And we're, we're, we're putting good stuff out there. We're putting bad stuff out there every single day. We have a choice about that. Beautiful. Well, Robin, I've got one final question for you. I know we're running over on our time here, but if someone came to you tomorrow and said, look, I want to perform better at every single thing I do as a human being, what are the three most important pieces of advice you'd have for me? What would you tell them? Mm, I love that question because this gets really concrete and it's not very hard. Number one, make sure that you are eating more real food. Make your own dang food. Um, the deeper in the supply chain, if you got it in a drive through I know that you teach your audience this very well, but eat better food that you make yourself as much as possible. Number two, hang out with people. Spend time with people who inspire you. They are either bringing you up or they're bringing you down. There's, there's no, there is no flat line. We never stay the same. If we were flat line, we know what flat line is. We've seen the, we've seen ER and Gray's Anatomy. We are constantly in flux. Help people that st- keep you in those smooth vibrations, those peaceful, loving, generous, compassionate vibrations. And third, clean up the chaotic frequencies in your environment. Don't think just because you can't see them that they don't matter. I would say the most important thing is control the Wi-Fi. Turn it off on your phone. Don't be in a room where Wi-Fi is radiating you all day, every day. Beautiful. Well, Robin, thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Where can people find out more about your new book? The new book is called Vibe, and you can get it anywhere books are sold. It releases on October 31st of this year, and uh, you can check us out at greensmoothiegirl.com and Green Smoothie Girl on Facebook. Awesome. Thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. My pleasure. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Head on over to your favorite bookseller, pick up a copy of the book, and while you're at it, log on to Amazon and leave a review because when you leave reviews for authors like Robin or me, we notice. It's one of the easiest things you can do to say thanks. It takes a few seconds of your time and it really, really helps us to know what we're doing that works what doesn't work, and it lets other people find our work that has thousands and thousands of hours of thinking and work behind it. So if you enjoy it, if you enjoy the show, you can leave a a review for the show. That really matters. Thank you.